My name is Professor Frank Bloomfield and I'm Director of the Liggins Institute and it's my real pleasure to welcome you to this evening's inaugural lecture of Professor Mark Vickers. Before we get underway, um, just a few housekeeping announcements. Could you please all turn your phones to silent <laughs> call? Or <laughs> we'll turn them off. Bathrooms, if you should need them, are outside across the foyer or down the corridor. And should there be an emergency, the red lights will flash and sirens will go off and we should all meet outside um, in the quad, please. So the annual inaugural lecture series is an opportunity for the university to showcase its new professors. And this is, of course, the highest rank of the university and an honor well worth celebrating. And this evening, of course, we're here for the inaugural lecture of Professor Mark Vickers, an accidental journey, journey into developmental programming. So Professor Vickers has elected to deliver his lecture in his academic regalia this evening, meaning that I had to wear mine also. And this mode of apparel dates back to the late 11th, early 12th century, when all of the academics, of course, were members of scholastic or monastic orders. And in those days, the copes were completely closed so that they couldn't show off the finery of their clothes and could maintain their modesty. But in the um, time of Henry VIII, that as academic robes became more formalized, that um, fell by the wayside and robes became open precisely so that people could show off their um, finery. And we'll see that from Professor Vickers this evening. <laughs> So the robes of the University of Auckland are based largely on those of the universities of Cambridge and Oxford. And the introduction of specific colours for specific degrees is actually quite a late invention, only in the last couple of hundred years. So Professor Vickers' career actually in science started when he took on the role of a research assistant in the Research Centre for Developmental Medicine and Biology, the precursor of the Liggins Institute, really, which was in the Department of Paediatrics under the supervision of um, Professor Bernhard Breyer. And Mark work, worked for Bernhard for three years before going on his OE to Germany and then returning back to do a master's and then a PhD under the supervision of Bernhard and um, Sir Peter Gluckman. And I'd really like to welcome um, Professor Bernhard Breyer back to the Liggins Institute. It's great to have you here this evening, Bernhard. So Mark's PhD was awarded the best doctoral thesis at the University of Auckland. Perhaps not surprising when the first publication from his PhD was published in the American Journal of Physiology and resulted in a paradigm shift in the field of the developmental origins of adult disease. It's been cited almost a thousand times, was the most cited paper of the decade in the American Journal of Physiology, and it reported the effects of the postnatal amplification of a prenatal phenotype with postnatal diet. And I think it's fair to say that the images of Mark Vickers' fat and lazy rats has been f flashed up on conference screens around the world, um, not always by Mark. <laughs> Subsequent to his PhD, he continued his research at the University of Auckland and undertook research into interventions to try and reverse these adverse effects of the intrauterine environment. And this resulted in the award of the Hamilton Prize, which is a very prestigious award from the Royal Society for a really seminal paper by an early career researcher. So in his career to date, Professor Mark Vickers has published over 130 peer-reviewed articles um, and 16 book chapters, presented his work widely in international conferences and has numerous international collaborations. And his work, of course, fits perfectly with the work at the Liggins Institute into how the alterations in early life environment can lead to increased risk for development of metabolic and cardiovascular disease later in life. So Professor Vickers is going to tell us today about how his research has provided invaluable empirical evidence to support the developmental origins of health and disease paradigm. And although that was initially treated skeptically by many, not Mark's research, of course, but the, the hypothesis in general, I think the contribution that is made has meant that it has now become firmly established um, as an important uh, mechanism. So Mark, we're looking forward to hearing about your unexpected journey into the field of developmental programming. Thank you very much, Frank, for that wonderful introduction. And I feel quite privileged now to 
have my career mapped out like that in such a short time. Um, so I've been around for a long time, as many of you may guess. Um, I've stuck to a good thing. I've had a, uh, had a good formula and I've been very well mentored and supervised over my career, so I never actually saw the need to actually leave what is now the Liggins Institute, and hopefully I'm around for a while to go yet as well. Um, so if you look back at my university entrance, <laughs> this is to prove that I used to have hair back in the old days. If you look at where I started back at school, I wasn't heading towards a, 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 a sort of a science background where I've ended up now. So I was doing the arts type subjects, English, economics, geography, history and so forth. So I sort of fell into this by accident. So a lot of you who know me will know how I got into this role through uh, Bernard Bry, who I, who I basically owe my whole career to basically. So thank you again Bernard for being here today. Because by luck I, I landed on your desk and uh, I haven't, haven't left basically. Um, <laughs> I think this is why I was single for so long. Um, so basically, <laughs> hey, oh, come on, go on. It's, it's stress made it all fall out. Um, doing a PhD. So I started off with my BSc in geography, because I did geography because it was a subject I liked. I was one of those suckers at the time who fell into a subject I liked, so I carried it through to university. Um, but there aren't many options available with, with geography, so I had a bit of a brick wall. So I was there, I was actually unemployed for a period of time. And then I fell into a government work scheme um, whereby they, they placed people and I, I was managed to get a, a position with Bernard Breyer. Um, and then I worked as a technical assistant in the Department of Pediatrics for, for a while, for three years, and also through Bernard Breyer, he found me a contact in Germany through Dr. Werner Bloom, who I'll talk about in a minute. So I went over to Germany and worked as a technical assistant at the Children's Hospital in Germany. So I spent about two, three years in Tübingen, which is just outside of Stuttgart, and then I spent about a year at the Institute for Physiology just outside of Munich. So I had a great time overseas. Um, and then I'd got the bug about research, so I decided to come back and, and, and follow um, my research interests. So I came back to Auckland, and once again, through support from um, Bernard and Peter Gluckman, I managed to get into a Master's of Science in Medical Science. <laughs> Uh, which I did in reproductive biology, and then I passed on to, uh, went on to do a PhD in paediatrics. So all under the guidance and mentorship of um, Bernard Breyer. So here's a picture up here of Bernard in the old days, and I think that's Peter Gluckman. It isn't, yeah. So these jumpers wouldn't have gone amiss from the the midwinter party we had this year at the Liggins. Um, so that's where I started off. That's my first sort of lab desk there, Research Centre for Developmental Medicine and Biology, and. I went to work for uh, Dr. Werner Bloom, who was very, very well noted in the, in the growth hormone IGF-1 area, and also Professor Michael Ranke, who many of you may know as well in the, in the growth hormone biology area. So I was very lucky to get a position at the a hospital in Germany. I went over to Germany not speaking a, a word of German, so I just fell into this position. Luckily, everything in the, in the lab there was in English, so it all worked out quite well. And after, after German, um, uh, Tübingen here, I moved on to the lab of Dr. Helga, Helga Salvein and I did some sort of large animal stuff looking at the role of BST and so forth in, in cows. And where I worked there also happened to be the home of the oldest brewery in the world. So I'd actually fall into, into almost a perfect work environment there. <laughs> and I was also only a couple of train stops away from the Munich Oktoberfest. So that was great. But at some point that fun had to stop. So what I did here is I spent a lot of time setting up radio menu assays and so forth um, that I'd learned how to do back in, in, in Bernard's lab. Um, so came back to Auckland, got serious and did my other degrees. But while I was in the lab over in, in, in Germany, I did pick up the bug for doing research and I did manage to get co-authorship on a couple of papers. We looked at old methods like FPLC looking at uh, nephrotic syndrome in these kids. But when I started in Bernard's lab, I was actually completely lab naive. I'd never been in the lab before. I made a few mistakes that I don't even think Bernard knows about. Um, <laughs> a classic one was doing free fatty acid assays the old way with it. Uh, you had to shake the tubes manually. Um, and I used the wrong kind of tubes and came back after lunch and they'd all melted all over the, the, <laughs> the lab bench. Quickly kind of hide those away. Um, but what I did learn back then was attention to detail. If somebody told you a protocol that says shake for five minutes, you shook for five minutes. You didn't try and take a shortcut and do three or three and a half. Because I learned the hard way that things don't work if you don't follow detail. And that's an aspect of my career that I followed through to all my animal studies and so forth to make sure they were um, designed to the nth degree. So I did my MS thesis with um, Bernard Breyer, along with a couple of andrologists, Curtis Gravitz and Patrick Casey. And 
we looked at the effect of growth hormone and IGF-1 on um, sperm characteristics, so primarily the effect of I, um, growth hormone IGF-1 on sperm motility, sperm morphology and so forth as well. And obviously that was a highly successful project, so we managed to get five papers out of my master's project, so I knew I was actually working in the research environment which was going to nurture me through my, my PhD studies. So that was a great introduction to, to postgraduate study. So then I fell into this area of development of programming. So about the time I finished my master's uh, work, there was a lot of or burgeoning interest in this whole idea of fetal origins of adult disease, or FOAD as it was called at the time. Um, and the definition of that, most of you in the audience will know, a stimulus or insult operating at a critical or sensitive period of development that results in a long-standing effect on the structure or function of the organism. So I, I, I moved away from the sort of andrology, the sperm um, work, and wanted to get into this whole idea of what happened in the early life environment dictated largely what happened in later life. Um, and David Barker, um, who sort of popularised um, this work, I was fortunate enough to meet David quite a few times during my career, and he knew what we were doing back here in Auckland, and he always had some constructive advice on, oh, you should be looking at this and should be looking at that. So I was very fortunate to, to, to meet the person who actually popularised the science on a number of occasions. And this is a, a, one of the prime examples of, of the work that David Barker did in, in the early days, um, showing the link between birth weight and impaired glucose tolerance. So as birth weight goes down, impaired glucose tolerance percent goes up. Um, back in these days, there was a heavy em emphasis on, <coughs> sorry, on birth weight, but birth weight is just a proxy for a programming phenomenon. Um, uh, and we also know there's a kick in the tail here. So we know at the other end of this birth weight spectrum, there's also problems in terms of macrosomia and large babies as well. So programming of the years, um, initially it was met with some scepticism. Uh, people didn't believe how, how important the early life environment was and they couldn't believe, believe that such um, an early life environment dictated such a large degree of, of later disease. But obviously, as we know, programming has become a major area of science internationally. It's been popularised in the press such as here and it's even um, grown enough now to have its own journal that a lot of us contribute to. So in terms of critical windows of opportunity, so I'm going to talk about my journey into setting up these models to provide empirical data to support the programming work and also how then we went into doing intervention strategies. So now we have our genotype and we've got our environment feeding into a period whereby in early life where we're developmentally malleable, we're plastic, so we're very, very susceptible to the cues we're picking up with the external environment. And a combination of these feeds into our adult phenotype. And this graph you've seen many, many times, and I think it's been redrawn a lot of times as well, but it simply shows how important this early life period is in terms of plasticity and how is, this is the optimal time to intervene if you're going to. We all hear about these uh, treatments for diabetes and obesity in later life, and they're largely ineffective. So I concentrated my, most of my career on this period here where I had the greatest chance of intervening with some effect. So the earlier their intervention, the bigger the effect on later risk reduction. So what does determine our health potential? We know that what we eat and how active we are feeds into disease risk, but we also know what happens now in the early life period provides the first hit, the primary hit, then we have the sort of one, two, sort of second hit hypothesis. So one of the first studies we did, which I'll talk about in a minute, was combining early life adversity with postnatal high fat nutrition, and that amplified the postnatal phenotype. And we at the Liggins were the first group internationally to do that. And that kind of approach now is used in, uh, widely around the world. So we also know we have this vicious cycle of disease. Um, you've got your fat boy ice cream sandwich and your chocolate coated potato chips here. So you've got maternal undernutrition. I don't think we can buy these here. This was in the States. Um, so maternal adversity, it could be undernutrition. We've done both ends of the spectrum, maternal undernutrition and maternal obesity. And we have to remember that maternal obesity in itself can be a form of malnutrition as well, leading to altered fetal neonatal nutrition, feeds into this with diet, physical activity, childhood obesity. And as we go round and round, we see this vicious cycle ensuing. And we need to break this cycle, because as we know from reports a couple of weeks ago, New Zealand is actually now the third fattest country in OECD behind USA and Mexico. So the programming work we do is a key element in breaking the cycle across generations of disease. And where I came in was, was animal models. And once again, I was very naive. I think my experience, with, my first experience with working with rats was with Sonia Woodle, who's also here, and I think I was just let loose in Sonia's room. 
There was no health and safety, no legislation, training, no nothing. Here's a room, there's some rats in it, go and play. And that was it, basically. And I think Sonia came and saw me afterwards and said, what did you do to those rats? <laughs> Remember that? A long time ago now. But that was my introduction to working in, in animal models. Um, so preclinical models are a key tool for the investigation of mechanisms that underlie the early life development of obesity and related metabolic disorders. So what actually can be programmed? <laughs> oh, I was meant to animate that. Sorry, the eyes came up first. Um, so what actually can be... <laughs> looks a bit sad, actually, sorry. Um, so what actually can be programmed? Nearly every aspect of physiology that we've looked at it during my career anyway, and that with collaborators, can be programmed. We've shown evidence of altered cardiovascular system, blood pressure, obesity, we've done some work on lung, stress axis, puberty, polycystic ovaries, depression type disorders, inflammatory disorders, changes in insulin sensitivity, bone density, glucose control, hepatic steatosis, renal function, nephron deficit, and unsurprisingly, if all these things are perturbed, that you get reduced lifespan. So we always have this ethos of making the most of the animals that we've used in our experiments as well, and either through our group directly or through collaboration, we've looked at nearly every single aspect from central down to the gonads, and through Deb Sabota, we've done a lot of work actually in the ovary as well, showing altered ovarian ageing and, and reproductive um, disorders, for example. So when we first started, back with, with Bernard and my PhD, it was looking at maternal undernutrition, because that was at the time, that was what most people were developing, so models of maternal um, um, or fetal growth restriction. And it's very easy to mimic this experimentally. Obviously, if you undernourish a mother, you get short, lighter pups, so you see quite significant growth restriction here, which mimics quite nicely the, the clinical setting of IUGR. But what happens is this pup here grows into this one here, and these guys are eating the same diet. These guys have just got a programmed disorder, a thrifty phenotype, they store energy for a rainy day, but that rainy day never comes. So these guys are eating the same food, and what we did then, through the guidance of Bernard Breyer, we actually coupled that with a postnatal high-fat diet to amplify the phenotype. And at that time, nobody had done that before, so it did show some considerable insight from, um, from Bernard as well. And that was, the, that was the paper at the time, Fetal Origins of Hyperphagia, this means appetite um, disorders, overeating, obesity and hypertension, and postnatal amplification by hypochloric nutrition. As Frank said, it was um, the most cited paper of the decade, 2001-2011, in AJP. It's cited almost a thousand times now, and it was the first study to use a high-fat diet to amplify the programmed phenotype. And this approach is actually now standard. If you look at the literature, 99% of the papers you'll see, you'll see a programming model coupled with a high-fat diet to amplify the phenotype. And you'll see another couple of Ligon's authors here at the time, Wayne Cuffield and Paul Hoffman. I think Paul's here. So you remember that? No, Citation classic, isn't it? <coughs> and this is just a, uh, an example of some of the data that sort of came out of that paper. Um, if you look at systolic blood pressure, fasting plasma insulin on the left. These are our control animals, fed a standard diet. So just offspring of a normal pregnancy, normal, normally nourished mother, blood pressure's normal. You give them a high-fat diet, blood pressure goes up a bit, as you'd expect. But this blue line here represents the effect of the maternal nutritional environment on offspring blood pressure, so the so-called programming effect. I mean, I don't like using the word programming a lot, but I haven't got an alternative at the moment. So you see quite a marked programming effect. So these, these animals become hypertensive purely on the basis of what their mothers ate during pregnancy. If you give them a high-fat diet, you amplify that phenotype even further. And very similar here for insulin, Maternal diet makes the offspring hyperinsulinemic, add a high-fat diet into the mix, and they're even worse off. Um, and as they age, this sort of mismatch, I'll talk about in a minute, um, actually amplifies with age. So the greater the nutritional disparity between early life and later life, the greater the effect on phenotype. And also at this time, we had access to some pretty high-tech equipment at the time for looking at locomotor activity. So in these boxes, using um, an array of infrared beams, we could actually measure locomotor activity in these animals. And nobody looked at locomotor activity as a, a consequence of programming before. So we put these animals in this box and looked at their activity. And we were the first to show that animals that were born to undernourished mothers actually had reduced physical lo locomotor activity. This is voluntary locomotor activity. And concomitant with that, they had increased appetite. So they were hyperphagic and lazy, basically. And if you had a, added a high-fat diet into that mix, you amplified that phenotype. So they became very inactive, and they spent a lot of time just sitting around and eating. And we also show that this phenotype was actually present as early as day 35, and that's about two weeks after weaning. So at a very young age, before the presence of obesity, 
these animals, both females here and males here, were showing reduced physical activity levels. So we'd programmed this thrifty phenotype, this reduced locomotor activity. And we thought this was really exciting at the time, so we actually, for the first time, submitted this to science. And I don't know if you remember some of the communications around this, Bernard. I mean, I was a bit pissed off at the time, but um, that, that's life, and I'm, I've learned to get used to it now, 20 years on. Um, but if you see the editor's feedback, um, you will see that the sets of comments are positive and recommend publication after minor revision. Unfortunately, we do not, we, that's the sort of the start of a sort of sentence of death. The guy <laughs> did not believe in programming. He said, it's hard to reconcile the effects of the early life environment on later life outcomes. They even made us go away and do another study. And we actually went away and did that and they still come back. And if you look at the nature of some of the comments from the reviewers, stunningly important paper, widespread influence in endocrinology. So we couldn't get into science despite a lot of toing and froing with the editor. So it ended up being in AJP, I think it was again. <coughs> ended up on the front page of the New Zealand Herald, uh, born lazy, blaming mother type of thing. So it got a lot of lot widespread press. But what's annoying is it's been cited about 300 and something times now, but it's also been cited a lot in Science and Nature from people who have done similar um, experiments a bit later on. So we may have just come along at the wrong time to get that in, because we obviously had a sceptic in the, in the, in the editor editor that we had at the time. A bit frustrating. So if you want to encapsulate all the work we did on maternal undernutrition, um, a few years work you can cap encapsulate here. And a lot of this work was derived from some of the initial work that Sonia had done in, in the undernutrition model in the rat as well. So it's good. To, one thing that's actually quite comforting is over the 20 years or so I've been doing rats, in, and I've even changed this, the strain of rats across, the phenotype is as consistent as ever. I can predict what the blood pressure will be in the environment I've put these animals. So it shows the stability of these animals over time. Uh, if you look at this range of outcomes here, offspring of control, pregnancies here, offspring of mothers that were undernourished, you can see for every aspect of what we looked at here, there's a marked perturbation in their program phenotype. And each one of these is actually worsened in the presence of a high fat diet. High blood pressure, hyperinsulinemic, leptin resistant, fat, hyperphagic, increased C peptide, lazy, and they've even got reduced um, rectal temperatures as well. And together with uh, some work that uh, Bernard instigated, along with um, Michael Davidson and, and Jason Landon, we even looked at some measures outside of our typical phenotype measures, and we looked at some learning, and we also showed that offspring of undernourished mothers had quite significant learning deficits. So in addition to all the sort of the basic phenotype we looked at in terms of adiposity and, and diabetes and leptin resistance related matters, we also showed that they had learning deficits which is very similar to what is seen in some uh, clinical scenarios as well around SGA and so forth. And this is what I was talking about, nutritional mismatch, the double hit. I showed you before about this double hit, the in the utero environment and the postnatal environment creating this double hit. And this is a book that um, P uh, Peter Gluckman and Mark Hansen put out a few years ago now called Mismatch. But this is an example that's used quite widely, and that's plasma leptin. So once again, you've got offspring of control animal uh, pregnancies here, undernourished pregnancies here. These guys are eating the same diet, but you see there's, a, there's an increase in, in leptin as a result of programming. But if you put these animals that were born to an undernourished mother on a high-fat diet, you see this massive um, increment in the um, amplification of, of circulating leptin levels. So the greater the nutritional mismatch, the greater the effect on later phenotype. And this is what's typically seen in things such as nutrition transitions and rural urban migrations, where people are moving into the cities where they're getting access to Western-style diets. They may have been born in an area uh, relatively impoverished, but they've actually then moved into a, a, a region where there's plentiful supply of Western-style diets, and that's when you get this explosion of diabetes and obesity. But then the field changed. We started putting grants into um, HRC and so forth, and uh, undernutrition was an issue. They didn't like the, uh, the models of, of undernutrition, the rodent, and a, a more pressing problem at the time was that of the increasing rates of maternal obesity. So we went away, and similar to the undernutrition models, we went away and developed some um, models of maternal obesity using quite moderate high-fat diets throughout pregnancy and lactation. And once again, offspring of a controlled pregnancy, offspring of a mother that was fed a high-fat diet through pregnancy and lactation. Once again, eating the same chow diet, this guy has developed a, a marked and profound uh, phenotype related to hyperphagia and obesity, leptin resistance and so forth. And the results were quite similar for, for both genders. So it was quite easy to set up another animal model looking at maternal high-fat feeding on offspring phenotype. And if you want to look at some of their sort of more broad phenotypic outcomes, look at body fat as assessed by DEXA scan, 
offspring of controlled pregnancies, offspring of um, obese pregnancies, see a marked increase in body fat. Remember, these guys are eating the same diet postnatally. And you can see, if you look at their, just their body weight growth curves, there's a marked divergence in body weight in those offspring who were born to high-fat-fed mothers. And not unsurprisingly, they've got high leptin levels and high insulin levels as well. And we've started looking at some of the mechanistic basis, um, looking at taste receptors. Um, so we even found programming effects, and this was also reported for the first time with some work we did with Stephanie Segovia and Claire Reynolds, looking at the gut taste receptors. So even the gut taste receptor expression is different in offspring that were born to obese mothers, and that's going to influence uh, glucose sensing and so forth as well. Um, and when we give these guys a food choice protocol, so we, in the cage we give them free access to whatever food they want to make, whatever diet they want to eat, whether it's the high fat or the chow or whatever, offspring of obesogenic fed mothers always select the wrong food, the unhealthy food. Nine times out of ten, they'll go for the high fat, the uh, obesogenic diet. And if you look at their weight gain over it, just even a ten day period, you'll see that the offspring of obese mothers, via selecting the wrong type of food, show a marked increment in their body weight gain over time. And that's just a picture of me having my first beer, I think, showing altered food's preference in me and central adiposity <laughs> programming effect. Um, so we know that maternal diet can program appetite, preferences in offspring. Similar effects have been shown by Mike Simons um, over in the UK. And there's also been, albeit limited, data from the Dutch famine cohort showing that the offspring in the Dutch famine cohort have a preference for fatty foods. So once again, we can reconcile some of the animal work we've done with um, some clinical outcomes or epidemiological outcomes. And also when Deb Slavoda was here, we looked in the literature, so there's a lot of people starting to work on high fat, high sugar type diets, but nobody had really looked at the effect of maternal sugar intake in isolation on maternal outcomes. So we did quite a simple study where we gave the equivalent of two cans of soda a day, so not a lot, so it was about 20% of the calories was derived from soda via, via fructose um, in these mothers. And what happened? Even, this is just one marker that came out of it, at birth, in the offspring, they were already showing signs of hyperleptinemia. So this really moderate intake of fructose by the mothers during pregnancy led to this programming of leptin resistance in these animals. I, I can't really call it leptin resistance, I suppose, because we didn't call it, uh, we didn't challenge them, but hyperleptinemia, I should say. So they're, they're all already kind of hardwired to fail in early life based on what the mother had consumed during pregnancy. So maternal fructose intake resulted in increases in obesity-related hormones and offspring at birth. And this was really exciting. It got into endocrinology. It was, it was in a, in a follow-up paper in PLOS looking at some of the mechanisms. But when the press got wind of it, it was a classic example of when not to talk to the press, especially when one of the authors was sitting in a bar in, in, in Mount Eden at the time. So this made the front page of the Herald. We got the front page of the Herald for the second time. And the basic headline was, Pregnant Women Should Not Eat Fruit. And that it sounds funny, but did a lot of damage, and people were very serious about it. And some of the clinicians we had uh, had people coming in saying we were told not to eat fruit because it contains fructose. So, fruit juice, apples linked to fetus harm. Fruit, fructose can harm babies. And what was the other one? Uh, why a pregnant rat should avoid apples. There were some really weird headlines that came out. <laughs> but it, but it was quite serious because the whole entire message had got wrong. Fruit contains fructose there by thereby fructose is bad. So we did a lot of damage control um, trying, to, trying to educate people around what we meant by the fructose we'd use in terms of it was a highly refined crystalline fructose, high fructose corn syrup, for example. But it just shows how a simple story can get completely messed up in the press. So we set up these nice models of programming. There was no doubt that programming occurred. If you manipulated the maternal environment, you had an adverse outcome in the offspring. So we wanted to see if whether we could reverse programming. And there was little done in this field as well. You see from our career, a lot of the work at the Liggins, we seem to be just ahead of the game all the time in terms of our uh, sort of innovative thinking. There was some early work done on taurine back, back a couple of decades ago, looking at a low protein model. But nobody really looked at reversing agents. And most people had thought that developmental programming led to a, um, sort of a permanent change in developmental trajectory. So we started looking at reversal agents in our lab. So yes, we can reverse programming, and we've done at least an animal model, that's a caveat. So we've done a lot of uh, reversal agents here. I mean, over the career, we've actually done quite a lot, and this doesn't list all of them. So leptin, growth hormone, IGF-1, uh, choline, acipimoxin, and sensitizer, taurine, omega-3, CLA with clear Reynolds, prevention of catch-up growth, and even more recently, we've done some insulin. So we've done a lot of agents that do effectively reverse some of these programming effects. And I'll take you through a few sort of key examples from these. 
So the first thing we did was leptin. We know these animals display signs of leptin resistance in later life, and we know they're hypoleptinemic at birth. Um, and we'd also showed some more work with um, Shiva, Bettina, and Kanachia, one of the students in our group in Bernard, back in 2001, that the, the loop link between um, uh, leptin and insulin was perturbed as a result of developmental programming. And if you look at these slides here of islets in the pancreas, you can see the islet from a control um, offspring from a control pregnancy, offspring from undernourished pregnancy. It's just an example of the dysregulation. The brown staining is it's for leptin on the periphery of the islets. So we knew that the adiponsal axis in these animals was perturbed, and we thought, what if we replace leptin in the early life pair and see if we can rescue this phenotype? And at around the same time, Sebastian Bure had looked at the OB-OB mouse, which is a leptin-deficient mouse model, and showed that if he replaced leptin in the early life period, he could also rescue the phenotype in that genetic model. So we did a quite a simple study using our model of undernutrition in the rat. Once again, you can see quite a few uh, leptin, I mean, uh, ligands authors up there as well. So we gave them 10 days worth of leptin treatment in the neonatal period um, and followed them up postnatally. And as you can see, offspring born to undernourished mothers just got fatter and heavier over time. That has showed this completely aberrant growth profile and that has kept laying down fat and so forth. But in the, in the undernourished offspring that we gave leptin to, we completely normalised their phenotype. This is in females, it's important for a point I'll bring up later. Um, and in this case, leptin treatment to normal offspring of normal pregnancies had no effect. And every aspect of their phenotype that we looked at, whether it was fat mass, blood pressure, insulin, leptin, was completely normalised in these animals. And we appeared to reset this phenotype through this early life intervention. So we completely restored their postnatal growth patterns and physiology. And that led to quite a, a range of papers that came out of that, um, even some stuff. Graham Wake's in the audience here, I mentioned that paper later on, even modelling some of the data. And through collaboration, we had a lot of in-depth in work done on this through University of Cambridge and University of Southampton as well. And it shows the power of having a good animal cohort bank, because uh, together with Alwyn Firth and Jill Cornish, we actually published a paper only a couple of weeks ago on this cohort, which was generated back in about 2005. So we've stored samples from a precious cohort and are still milking it, basically. And based on my master's work, I had this interest in growth hormone and IGF-1, and we know from some of the work that Sonia and Bernard done in the early days that the growth hormone IGF-1 axis was also perturbed in this early life environment. So the first study we did was look at adult IGF-1 treatment, and we've also done adult growth hormone treatment. You can see the titles of the papers down here. We know, like I showed you before, offspring of undernourished mothers are hypertensive, high blood pressure, but if you give them IGF-1, you can actually lead to a marked decrease in, in blood pressure. So we got about a 20% decrease in blood pressure, so normalise their blood pressure um, as a result of IGF treatment. And growth hormone treatment to adults showed a very similar effect. But like I was saying before, at this period of life, they're not actually that plastic. Um, so we wanted to go back and see if we could actually look during this critical period of plasticity whether we could intervene back then with components of the growth hormone system. So together with people like uh, Dr. Claire Reynolds and Dr. Clint Gray, we did a pre-weaning growth hormone treatment um, paradigm, very similar to the leptin one we'd done, and looked at the offspring phenotype in later life. So as you can see, once again, we see an increase in blood pressure as a result of this programming phenomenon, increase in fat mass. We also see uh, a pro-inflammatory phenotype. This is IL-1 beta as an example. And this is around day 150 of age in adult life. But you can see that the animals we exposed to growth hormone during that first period of life have got a completely resolved phenotype in adulthood. And a lot of the features we looked at, whether it was endothelial dysfunction, uh, ventricular hypertrophy, bone marrow macrophage inflammation, adipose tissue insulin resistance, we managed to restore all of these features with neonatal growth, growth hormone exposure. And this work got into a, a couple of papers and also got an editorial feature in the Journal of Endocrinology, which is quite a, um, uh, an accolade for the work. And I can't go through all the interventions we've done, there is a caveat to a lot of the interventions we've tried. Um, they work extremely well in the setting of programming, but they can have adverse consequences if you test them in the setting of a normal pregnancy. So we've done taurine, methyl donor such as choline, folic acid. With clear, we've done CLA, conjugated linoleic acid, fish oil, Ben Albert, um, and also some more recent work with um, Alan Firth and along with Justin O'Sullivan as well. So here's an example of a taurine supplementation. There was an old literature back in the 80s about giving taurine in the drinking water to um, offspring of low protein fed mothers and it seemed to restore the pancreatic phenotype in those animals. Um, and there's also some evidence that taurine can restore insulin sensitivity in animals that are fed, in normal non-pregnant animals fed a, a high sugar diet. 
So we went back to our model of maternal fructose intake, and as you can see here, mums that consume fructose during pregnancy become hyperinsulinemic, inflammatory profile, and they even show a marked store, uh, score as relates to ste um, hepatic steatosis, so the liver is actually quite damaged as well due to this fructose, even though it's only a 20% 20, 20 load um, but relative to calorie intake. But when we put some taurine in their drinking water, we completely rescued all these effects, so we negated this, um, these adverse effects of um, taurine supplementation. So it was quite exciting data as well. And similarly with conjugated linoleic acid, which is a compound which is found in a lot of meat and dairy, which is um, high in a lot of the meat and dairy found in New Zealand. Um, if you look at maternal insulin sensitivity on the left here, you can see that a high fat diet during pregnancy leads to um, a change in maternal insulin sensitivity. If CLA is added to the diet, we can rescue that phenotype. And also, not just maternal health, but if you look at the offspring, once again we looked at the gut inflammatory profile here, you see a marked increase in TNF-alpha in the gut as a result of maternal high fat diet, but once again, CLA as a supplement in the diet can restore that phenotype. But the caveat is that one size does not fit all, and the potential is that interventions in the setting of intact systems may actually lead to adverse outcomes. And we've shown that for taurine, for example, if you give taurine to a, a normal pregnant mother, it can actually have an increase in neonatal mortality. That may be due to hypoglycemic effects, we don't know. Um, the trouble is the old literature, which is a trouble with the animal research field in itself, a lot of people don't give the intervention to a control group, so they have unbalanced study designs, and that's a point we'll come to in a minute as well. So leading on from our work, and given that programming can actually happen at any birth weight or across the spectrum, it's a continuum, it's how best to identify those at risk of program disorders, a tailored approach, use of metabolic markers, for example. And we know that, for example, from our leptin work, that the effects of neonatal leptin treatment are actually dependent upon prior maternal nutritional status and gender. And we actually did a follow-up paper using male neonates that were treated, and we showed that leptin treatment to male neonates of normal pregnancies can actually elicit an adverse metabolic phenotype. And at the time we were doing our leptin work, there were a few other groups in the UK in particular who were doing some maternal offspring uh, leptin studies, and they actually thought about adding leptin to infant formula as a sort of a panacea um, to curb obesity. And they were actually quite serious about it at the time. But we know that would have been disastrous if anybody had ever taken it seriously. And another thing which is um, overlooked, and the, the NIH is coming down particularly hard on this, if you don't look at six specific effects in grants that are submitted to the NIH, for example, they'll ask for a reason why. I said a lot of people who set up programming models looked at the, the male and female, looked at the, um, the phenotypes that emerged and chose the one that best suited their needs. Where sometimes the lack of a phenotype versus a phenotype is obviously very, very informative in terms of mechanisms. Um, and the old sort of adage that you can't use females because we try to avoid the confounds of estrus, which is something I used in, early in my career, is, is, is not able to be used anymore. So where possible, we should always look at the effect of male versus female and sexual dimorphism in programming. And here's a clear example here. If you look at the percenters from males, percenters from females, look at some of these inflammatory markers, you'll see there's a very distinct inflammatory pro uh, profile in the male percenters, but nothing at all in the females. So those studies where they've actually discounted sex and actually merged the data, you can see why they get a lot of noise. And what about the father? A lot of work was actually put towards the father, uh, um, the mother, as being sort of the, 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 where, where the blame should go. But there's increasing evidence about um, the role of the dad in the programming disorders. Um, some, a lot of this work was kicked off some work by um, Margaret Morris back in 2010, where they gave a chronic high fat diet in a mouse model, a uh, rat model, and, and they showed that they could um, program beta cell dysfunction in the female offspring. But since then, there's been dozens of papers showing uh, transmission of these programming effects through the um, paternal lineage as well. And of course, one of the benefits of using animal models is that we can very easily look at transgenerational effects. A lot of people use the term transgenerational when they're looking at F2, but F2 is not strictly transgenerational because F2 simply reflects uh, an impact of the initial environmental insult to the mother. So for true transgenerational work, you have to go to F3 and beyond. And with the rat and mouse models, you can do that quite easily. So that's one of the powers of the small animal models. And can we actually model it? Yes, we can. So some of our data went to um, Professor Graham Wake, who's here somewhere. And I've got to be honest, this is the only paper I've ever been a co-author on that I don't understand any of it. <laughs> I, I'd assigned the authorship form and that was as far as it went. 
but we, at the dynamics of our leptin system, our leptin reversal work, we can actually model, and I'm led to believe these formula sort of lead to that conclusion at the end. <laughs> well, so I'll have to take your word for it. So we can model the dy dynamic systems that result from some of our experiments as well. But our research doesn't all go to the plan. I've shown you some studies that we've done over the years which have actually worked out perfectly. We've developed nice phenotypes, we've reversed. Um, but back in the old days, we did some studies, a lot of studies actually, which haven't even been published. And Paul had done, if you remember, one of these ones with troglitazone, which was one of the insulin sensitizers on the market at the time, a TZD. Um, it was being taken by thousands upon thousands of people around the world um, as an insulin sensitizer. Um, one of the side effects of growth hormone treatment is a diabetogenic effect. So the, the animals that got the growth hormone treatment show an increase in plasma insulin concentrations. So we thought we'll give them growth hormone plus this insulin sensitizer. It was on the market at the time, FDA approved, and it worked extremely well at normalizing their insulin sensitivity. But when we opened up these animals, it was all liver. All you could see was liver. They were four or five times the size they should be. And this was a drug that was on the market at the time. And about the time we actually finished our animal study, um, there was about 63 liver failure related deaths in the US and in 2004, about the time we did some of this work, Pfizer set aside about a, US, uh, a billion dollars to cover the lawsuits. So we were testing a drug that for any, for, for we believed to be uh, approved, but it had quite disastrous effects in these animals. So we don't know how it actually got through to that stage and given to so many people. Because the effects on the animals in terms of hepatic um, enlargement was <laughs> the, the biggest I've ever seen in my career. And things have changed since I started as well. So back in 2000, Bernard, I don't know if you remember, uh, that all those days that Stefan and I were in that little room with our little Breville kitchen whiz, making diets, 10 to 15 kilos a day, absolutely no health and safety re uh, regulations at the time. Um, but now, switch forward to 2017, you can go online, order your diet, 25 kilos, press a button, but uh, our new problem is now that CyQuest says no. Um, so it may be easier to go back might be easy to go back to the stage here. <laughs> but it's very, very easy to get commercially um, available uh, research diets now. And the good thing is about these diets, they're open source. So you know over a 10 year period, they're not going to change. You can, you can get batch to batch consistency. And that makes a big difference when you're planning long term studies. And another big thing that's happened over the last few years is these so called <coughs> ARRIVE guidelines. Because there have been hundreds upon hundreds of papers that have shown beneficial effects of intervention agents and animal models, but a lot of them have been done poorly. They've been done using unbalanced study designs. You can't look at the papers and get much detail about how they've actually um, undertaken the work. So a lot of journals now are actually signing up for these ARRIVE guidelines whereby they want animal studies to be designed very much more like clinical studies. So balanced um, experimental designs, use of both sexes, controlled well, for example. And I think that's going to really improve the quality and relevance of animal models to the clinical setting, because there is that barrier of translation. So where to from here? So I so said we've done all these animal models, we've, we've, we've proven that we can reverse programming, so we need to take the next step in terms of either education or interventions in the clinic. So the one thing that sort of is funny in my career is back here, which I think you can't see the date, this is 1997 when I first got my uh, Woolley scholarship to start my PhD, and that's what the hospital kind of looked like back then. I don't know, was this the Wallace block? I can't remember what it was. Um, nothing has changed. I was giving a talk back here on the importance of early life nutrition, and I give talks now on the importance of early life nutrition. <laughs> Maybe I'm just really, really bad at it. But people come up to me after, after talks, especially when you go to GP conference, and they go, that makes so much sense. I've never heard of DOAD before. Um, so th they're on board once they hear about it, but we haven't maybe communicated this idea well enough over the years. So it comes down to this effective translation of research knowledge. I I've started here, I've done quite a bit of work at this end now, but we haven't managed to effectively translate any of our um, intervention strategies to any clinical scenario yet, mainly based on the do no harm uh, philosophy, because most of the interventions we've shown do not work in every setting. So more work is required. And I've also been very fortunate enough to work with an early life um, nutrition coalition, um, which is a panel of experts across Australia and New Zealand. And over the years, we've actually managed to get some uh, statement papers out. And we've also put together some resources which go into the bounty packs in the hospitals here. So tens of thousands of women have received these little um, books which give guidance to optimising nutrition during the first thousand years. And, and later in the year, I think we've got an official launch in Canberra um, of an advert 
um, which I'll play you. My generation may not be as healthy or live as long as those in the past. And it's the first thousand days of life that can make all the difference. Here's what parents can do. Eat well and maintain a healthy weight, especially during pregnancy. Breastfeed for as long as possible. Introduce solid foods, but not before four months. And remember, we learn from you. Visit the Early Life Nutrition Coalition on Facebook to find out more. So we've got this um, sort of public broadcast announcement which is going to be in Australia and New Zealand. Um, there's two versions of the ad. There's an Australian version with a slightly different accent and the New Zealand one. That was the New Zealand one. So I'm very lucky to be sort of involved where I can actually look at some of the work I've done in the, in the animal models of basic science and actually try and help and inform in some of the other end of the, of the spectrum. So I'm, I'm very privileged to be involved in some of those um, coalition sort of talks. And another thing we've done is we've actually translated some of the, the research technologies we've used. So, for example, with some work we did with um, Dr. Clint Gray, who's now left the Liggins, we looked at um, microRNA profiles in our model of undernutrition and showed quite specific microRNA signatures in the offspring of undernourished mothers, which link quite nicely to the um, ventricular hypertrophy and the blood pressure we saw. So we thought, well, do these microRNAs have utility as biomarkers in clinical samples? So luckily we had access to scope samples through Lucy McGowan. And we looked at microRNA profiles in maternal plasma in 20-week uh, um, uh, pregnancy samples. So this is 8 to 12 weeks prior to the actual event. So these are women who went on later to have a spontaneous preterm birth at 28 to 32 weeks. And what we found is at 20 weeks we could pick up very, very um, specific microRNA signatures. I mean, there's no overlap in that group at all. So that sort of informs that those microRNAs we picked up, and this, this related to a cluster of microRNAs, the 548 family, may be a very early and very sensitive and very specific marker for later preterm birth. Um, and you can see some of the individual microRNAs here, we saw here, no presence at all in the preterms. And this got a lot of press at the time, but now we have to go back and validate that in independent cohorts um, and in a, in a wider um, experimental sample as well. So that's just an example of sometimes how we can translate a, a, a bench a platform we're using into a clinical, clinically relevant model. So that's quite exciting. At the moment, Rachna Patel and our group is looking at the 15-week samples from this cohort as well. And also together with uh, Jackie Bay and, and her group, we're also looking at some translation of DOHAD into some of the small island developing sort of states. Um, so we've done a lot of work over in the Cook Islands in particular, um, where there's no evidence for DOHAD, because I mean, there's a lot of work linking early life events with later outcomes, but none of this is work has been done in some of these um, developing nations at all, and sometimes it's hampered by lower experimental power. So we're doing some work in the Cook Islands. You can see here in the adolescence, you can already see it um, at ages 13 to 14, 75, 60% respectively, male and female, are either overweight or obese. So we, this is a population where 91% of the adult population is overweight or obese, and you can see why adolescents are probably the, the key window of opportunity, because they're the next set of parents. So we're going in into the Cook Islands, um, and we're actually doing checks on these kids. You can see blood pressure here, we're doing glucose measurements. So we're actually in, informing and educating the, the adolescents about their own health profiles. But what we're also doing at the same time is we're actually going back to the, uh, Rarotonga Hospital and linking these outcomes, their BMI and so forth, with the birth obstetric registries to see if there's any early life um, influences on their later life health. So we're doing DOHAD, but it's in a smaller um, island context. And of course, over my career, if your photo's not up here, it's probably because I couldn't find it. There's a lot of people I've got to thank. I mean, obviously, Bernard Breyer and Peter Gluckman for, for, for actually giving me a start. If I hadn't walked into that door as an unemployed person that many years ago, I don't know where I'd be now. This all worked out rather well, I think, in the end. But also, uh, I've been very privileged. Um, the range of students, Alice is my first PhD student. I think she, there she is there. And Alice is here today, so it's great to see her. But a lot of a range of students, mentors, and, and colleagues and collaborators. So it's been a fantastic journey so far, even though I fell into it completely by accident. And also, I have to fund collaborators. I've been around long enough that I've actually got some funding at some point. Um, and HRC, uh, MB, AMRF, um, we've had a couple of Marsden grants, Kalaha, a lot of funding and support through Gravita. And we've also done quite a bit of work for some commercial entities such as Fonterra, Pfizer, and Danone. And also, I've got to thank the long-suffering Emma and, and, and Lila, um, who put up with me sort of moaning on about lack of funding, but they know I'm, I'm an optimist and things will always turn out in the end. So thank you very much for listening.
Congratulations, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark, for a wonderful journey through not only your career, but also the contribution you've made to the field of developmental origins to health and disease, really advancing our understanding of how some of these early environmental effects affect postnatal phenotype, also how potentially we may be able to uh, remedy those. And great to see that you're, now that you've got a professor, you're managing to spend some time in the Cook Islands. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Again, that was a terrific lecture. So that brings us to the end of um, this evening's ceremony. So thank you all very much for attending. Um, wish you a very good evening. And would also like to take the opportunity to invite you to our next inaugural lecture on November the 23rd, at the same time of Professor uh, Martin Kussman. So thank you very much for coming. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto tataro. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic.